Um, I will say that my name is Becca Oliver. I should have probably done that very early in the program. And I'm the executive director here at the Writers League of Texas. Um, and excited to to do this tonight. So we have a number of different programs that we're that we're doing online through Zoom over uh, every month, every week. We have at least one live webinar, and this particular program is called Ask Us Anything. And the idea is that we pick a topic that we know folks have questions about, and we let you send in as many questions as you'd like to. And then we do our best to find really smart people who can help to answer them and just spend the evening having a pretty, um, pretty free form conversation. So we're not, I'm not going to be putting specific questions to the panelists myself. We're going to use the questions that you guys sent in and then see where the conversation goes. How's that sound? Is everyone excited? <laughs> okay. I can hear you all saying yes. Um, so here we go. I'm going to introduce our two wonderful guests and then I'm going to give them each an opportunity to say a little bit more about themselves beyond what's on their bio. But uh, so excited to welcome Carolyn Cohagen. She began her writing career as a stand-up comic, performing in comedy clubs all over the world, including New York, Chicago, London, and Amsterdam. Carolyn's first novel, The Lost Children, was published by Simon & Schuster in 2010. Her young adult dystopian novel, Time Zero, was published by She Writes Press in 2016 and won eight literary honors, including the 2017 Reader's Favorite Award and the 2017 International Book Award. The sequel, Time's Next, was released in 2018, and the final book in the series is out already, right, Carolyn? Yeah, is already out. Um, time's up. She is the founder of a really wonderful organization called Girls with Pens, a creative writing organization in Austin for girls ages 8 to 14. So guys, just, you know, as loudly as you can virtually, please welcome Carolyn Cohagen. Thanks for being here. My pleasure, although I think it's a dirty trick to put my head shot up right there while I'm actually sitting here in person. Well, it's like they can see the evidence that you're as gorgeous as your photo. <laughs> <laughs> and look at another gorgeous lady joining us. So since joining Putnam in 2018, Michelle Howery edited the number one New York Times bestseller, I Really Needed This Today by Huda Kotke. Reese Witherspoon book club pick, Fair Play by Eve Rodsky, historical true crime and Austin author, American Sherlock by Kate Winkler Dawson, and The Paper Solution by Lisa Woodruff, the Marie Kondo of paper. Throughout her career, she has edited best-selling authors, including Denise Kiernan, John Kabat-Zinn, Marshall Goldsmith, Sean Covey, Kat Warren, Harriet Lerner, The Forks Over Knives brand, and even pushing the cat. <laughs> Please welcome everybody, uh, Michelle Howery. Thanks for being here, Michelle. Here's Thanks, guys. It's wonderful to be here. I've had the pleasure of going to your uh, the conference many times, and I'm sad that um, it won't be happening this year, but this is a nice substitute. We are glad to see your face um, and excited for the two of you to, to meet and have a little conversation. So this is... Um, so we have a lot of questions and what I did was I organized them, sort of grouped them in categories. Um, and the first topic that when you talk about traditional versus self-publishing, I think is for everybody that idea of they have to make a choice between one or the other, right? So that's where we're gonna start. But before we do that, I would love to give each of you, you know, we heard your bios, but to just get an even a little bit more of a sense, and I think especially for you, Carolyn, because you are um, no pressure but representing all authors everywhere tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but you also, from looking at your bio, you know, it's clear that you have been traditionally published and then you've also done your own publishing. So can you just give us a little bit more of, you know, your story as an author? Um, keeping in mind that we're going to get into even more of it as we continue through the evening, and then we'll um, and then we'll go over to Michelle for a little bit more about her too. Right. So as you said, so my first book, which is a middle reader book, right? So that means eight to twelve year olds. The Lost Children was Simon and Schuster, um, and then my second book, Time Zero, which is young adult dystopian, uh, was actually a hybrid publisher, right? So I've really done like 
the, the gambit, right? So hybrid is, for those of you that don't know, it really is in between, right? Because you don't get, um, uh, you don't get an initial payment, right? Uh, you don't get an advance, but um, you also get a larger royalty. But you are also paying, just like you would in self-publishing, you are paying the company for um, the artwork, maybe for the uh, editor, if you haven't already done the editing. And then uh, in my case, the thing that I was most excited about was She Writes Press had regular distribution uh, through Ingram. And there's like indie distribution through Ingram and then there's regular distribution through Ingram. They had regular distribution through Ingram and I had access to all of the um, traditional press meaning uh, Publishers Weekly and Booklist and Kirkus. Um, most of the trades will not review you if you are self-published. So there's this sort of in-between thing, right? Where you can, you, where you're still sort of putting up money up front, um, but they have a reputation to help you do things in a traditional way. Right. And then there's fully self-publishing, which I have also done and I'm doing now with my own press, which is called Girls With Pens, which I sort of branched out of my, uh, my teaching company. So yes, so I have done all three. Um, and I have a feeling that in the questions as they come up, they'll, I probably will answer why those transitions occurred. Okay, because I definitely want you to, but we'll we'll see how it, as it unfolds. And then if there are any questions to, to ask you, we'll circle back. Michelle, tell us about you a little bit more. I know that, you know, we heard your impressive bio and I know that you're at Putnam now, but I also think that, you know, one of the reasons why you were somebody that I thought of for this event, other than the fact that, you know, you're wonderful, was because you've worked at a, you've worked at a lot of different publishing houses as well. So you've been in, um, what, at least three or four of the big five? Where, what is your, in a, you know, in a shortened version, tell us sure. about your career trajectory. Yeah, I would say for the last 15 or so years, I've been at big, big five publishers. I've been at Putnam for about two years. Before that, I was at Hachette um, for a couple of years. Um, I was also at Simon & Schuster for about nine and a half years before that. That was the longest stint. But I did, I have also worked at um, small, almost like indie publishers in my early years. And I actually started my career in, during, in college at a university press. I worked for the Ohio University Press uh, um, as an intern for um, a, a part-time part -time for about a year when I was still in college. And then I, I worked for about three years after college at F&W Publications, which was a small, mid-sized independent press in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, working on a lot of how-to books. I worked on Writer's Digest books, which is actually kind of a um, wonderful, I very near and dear to my heart. Um, so working on writing instruction and stuff like that. So that was a, those were, that was a place that was small enough there. It wasn't, we didn't really deal a lot with agents. We worked a lot directly with authors, you know, and that was, I think that was more the norm 20 years ago and more the norm at a smaller place like that. But we would, you know, do a lot of our own commissioning of projects going out to folks and also receiving things unsolicited. Um, and then I, when I moved to New York, my first job was at a small press, small independent press called New Market Press which was run by a woman who had been a former executive at, at Bantam Doubleday Dell in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then had sort of started her own press. And so it was, it was a very fun, small, bootstrappy kind of a place. And I got to learn a lot um, because I was the person who was picking up the phone most of the times when, when anyone was calling, whether it was like an agent or Susie Orman, who was one of their authors, the finance, financial guru. So it was kind of fun to be able to, um, to, see all that stuff right up first. And then I sort of went into more traditional publishing um, after that. So it's, it's it, but, but, but the, the bridge job then, I worked for McGraw-Hill Business Books for a, about a year. And that was sort of a hybrid too. So I was doing a lot of commissioning of things directly, but I was also starting to work more and more with agents. And that's um, maybe something that I'm sure we'll get into later, but that sort of difference, I feel like in Big Five Publishing, you know, traditionally we've worked a lot more with agents than we have at some of the smaller places that I've worked at. Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to see if that's still going to be the case or how open we're going to be as, as, um, as I, I hope that we'll be more open, but figuring out how to do that. So. All right. Oops, see? I'm intrigued by, um, that little ender you just gave us. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, so we are going to um, hop into it. So the first category was the choice, and this was really these two questions that were somewhat similar that, that deal with that idea of um, when do you do, when do you choose, or when should you stop if you're gonna, if you're attempting the traditional publishing route, how long do you commit to that before you switch over? Um, I, I like having these two questions here because I have a really strong opinion about the whole premise of there, there really having to be a choice um, at a certain point, but, but I'm gonna read these and then we're gonna dive in. So I'm interested in traditional publication, but I'm open to self-publishing too. How long would you recommend searching for an agent before committing to self-publishing? Two days, 10 years, surely there's something in between. And then the other one um, that I thought was, was in a similar space, with COVID interrupting schedules and publishers reluctant to take anything but sure things, how many agents would you advise me to query before publishing with a small publisher or self-publishing? So, and I think I'll, I'll throw it to you, Carolyn, and sort of ask you not so much about answering directly these questions, which I'm happy for you to do, but to talk about that idea of um, that choice that an author makes about whether or not to go the traditional route or whether or not to go the self-publishing route. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh goodness, I was sure you were gonna go to Michelle first. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, you know, there's a lot of sort of about like, you know, what you learn in hindsight and, and everything else. And I, I will say that one of my pieces of advice now for people trying to make the decision is I do say, don't decide to self-publish because um, you are feeling um, that you don't, because you're impatient, right? Don't do it because you feel like, oh, I have this book and I finished it, you know, a week ago and I'm just dying to see it out there and I'm dying to see it in print and I'm dying to be able to hand it to, you know, my dad and say, I told you so, or, you know, I want to hand it out at the office. Like it's really, really exciting to see your book in print, right? It's, it's really, it's, it's an incredible feeling and there's really nothing like seeing your first book in print. But you should all know, you can get your book in print. Like you can go to KDP and you can print that baby and no one sees it but you, right? Like you can get basically an arc on your own and just see your book in print and design a cover. Like I print uh, the books for girls with pens, the kids. I print books of all of their work every summer. They're not for sale, right? They're just for the kids. And I do that on KDP. So like, I just feel like there is an impatience that happens when people hear, you know, oh, I, I queried agents for a year. I queried agents for two years that people are like, I don't have the patience for that. Right. Or they decide to be very cynical about the industry and they think, um, oh, you know, they only want a certain kind of thing. They're not looking for anything actually new or different. So, you know, screw the big five. Uh, I, I should do it this way. I have to do it this way. And I think that there's some fear there too. There's also some insecurity about not wanting the rejection of sending out query letters, right? Because it's hard. It is hard work to write those query letters and to send them all out and then, you know, to hear no thank you. Um, but if you're not ready for rejection, you're definitely in the wrong business. And it's hard to hear no from an agent, but frankly, it's harder to publish something and spend a lot of money doing it and then have nobody buy it. Mm -hmm. um, I just think like, I mean, I have no regrets with the way that I did things, which is that I started with something traditionally published and then went into self-publishing and having that first book traditionally published helped me tremendously. It helped me learn what I was doing so that I knew all the steps that needed to happen uh, when I moved on. And then it also helped me just reputation wise, you know, getting into schools um, and um, being welcome at different events and getting into book festivals, things like that. Cause it can be very hard when you've only self-published. So I, I, 
it's basically, I guess what I'm saying is, is if it's your dream to traditionally self-publish, I'm sorry, to tradition, sorry, just both. If it's your dream to traditionally publish, um, I think that you need to go for it. And I think that, um, you know, you need to be patient. And most people I know have spent a couple of years uh, before they get that agent. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think what I, why I wanted to start with these two questions is because, and you introduced this at the start of your answer, Carolyn, is the idea of what is your goal? What do you want here? Because you're absolutely right. And we'll talk about KDP a little bit um, at some point because we have a question about it. But if your goal is to have a physical copy of your book, then that's that's one thing, but that's something that you could achieve tomorrow, <laughs> probably, yes. right? Yes. Um, if your goal is, you know, what are the goals, I guess, and what we're going to hopefully do tonight is help folks start to understand or, or start to ask themselves some questions that will help them understand which of these routes might be the best fit for them. Because sometimes the way we approach it is by saying, well, you self-publish when you can't be traditionally published. Yeah, exactly. But actually what we're discovering is that there are, there are writers who are really good at being, at at doing the self-publishing. I mean, you are, are amazing at it. And people who, who take it, who understand it's, it's a full-time job, it's, it's work, it takes a great amount of strategy and marketing and all sorts of other things too. And then there are some folks who don't have that entrepreneurial desire <laughs> to do a lot of the things that come with that, or who maybe just really want to donate, can't even begin to think about doing it themselves and want to be in partnership with, with someone else. And so, I mean, and that's a really it's simplistic a way. It's yeah. a lot of work no matter what, right? Exactly. It's like, there's no easy route and there's no route that's going to be like, I wrote a book and now I'm just going to sit back and watch the money roll in. Like, that's just right. like, that's, that's not an option no matter what. And there's, there's no route in which you're like, you're not going to have to do marketing and that you're not going to need, you know, all the, your social media or, you know, or you're gonna have to choose a path of social media. Like it, there's just, um, of course, of course. And I'm being very simplistic and there's just two descriptions uh -huh. of two different people, but I do, but I think where I'm trying to go with it is perhaps instead of saying, should I uh, try to be traditionally published and then end up self-publishing, instead we should say to ourselves, yes. what is the better fit for me as a writer? Yeah, yeah. Which one of these paths, right? I uh, love to talk about goals, Becca. And I thought that was a really, that's a, that is sort of a great way to start that decision tree and start thinking about that. And, um, you know, some people want to see their book um, in a bookstore, in their local bookstore, and they want to go in and, and, and that might inform one path. Some people, I work with a lot of, I work on nonfiction and I work with a lot of authors whose book is a very important piece of their larger business. Um, the paper lady who I mentioned in my um, biography, you know, she, she, where I'm so excited to publish her book, it's coming out in August, it's going to be amazing. It's a great way to like, how to get rid of the paper in your life. But she's self-published two books before and they she has in, in the past she has used those as sort of a uh, lead generator to sell the amazing paper organizing kits that she sells and sells you know hundreds of them a year so it's like it's that for her it's a the book but her previous books had been like tools to get the rest of her business going and that and so she'd self publish those in this book she kind of wants to shift over into it and to have that book in the bookstore and, and and have it with different goals and so she decided to shift over to a more traditional publishing mindset because she wanted some support in the marketing and the publicity. And she had built this wonderful infrastructure. It was really impressive to me as an editor when I got, when I saw that proposal and we thought that we could sort of take all of her, all of the great business that she'd spent the last several years building and use that to, um, to help promote this new book coming out this year. Yeah, so I would love to keep those that in mind as we're talking tonight, like goals and sort of helping folks think about this whole process in terms of, you know, helping them figure out what might be the best fit for them, if that makes sense. Um, all right, so so that's all to say, we're not really going to answer these two questions <laughs> because we can't tell you uh, wait two years and then what we're going to try to do is answer these questions a little bit more um, with a little bit more nuance as we keep going tonight, if that is. Well, I'm also going to say, I mean, Michelle, I feel like I've, this is, <laughs> I feel like this COVID interrupting schedules and publishers reluctant to take anything but sure things like 
maybe those are two separate things. Like, I feel like it always feels like publishers are reluctant to take anything but sure things, right? That's <laughs> always how it feels from the outside, right? Right, it, right. You want something completely new, but exactly like what we've sold before and made a whole lot of money. So the idea of like COVID interrupting schedules, like, I don't know. I, to me, I'm just like, well, everyone has more time to read. Like people are home. And that's said, my publisher said something a few weeks, months ago that I've been like holding on to. He's like, we still need to publish books in 2021 and 2022. He's like, you know, yeah. we still have to be buying books. There was definitely a, a week or two in March when everyone was just sort of frozen and locked up. But, you know, we've had, we have had to adapt because we've all, we, we all want to keep doing what we're doing. And that's <laughs> so. what is also in Hollywood right now is that like, mm -hmm. they can't be making things. So they're all reading things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And I think also the idea of the sure things is really, you know, learning how to talk about your project in a way that, and learning those, those comparative titles that you should know, like, don't let a publisher come up with the title that they're going to compare your book to. You figure out what that title is, or at least as you're approaching agents, like there's ways to strengthen your ability to, you know, give evidence of a, a strong proposal, a strong idea um, to sort of get around get around that idea that they only want books from people who've already published bestsellers, which is absolutely not true. Especially in the fiction realm. I think everyone's looking for a wonderful debut novel. I think those are really exciting. And also, but also in the nonfiction realm too. That's absolutely true. Yeah, we like, we want, I, I love to, I, I am like an evangelist for comparative titles and getting and finding those and using those as like a marketing hook. So I love, I, um, I think that's, they're so important and it helps, it's, it informs everything that we do to um, think about how to buy the book and we're going to put it in the bookstore. All right. Ooh, now we're going to go to genre and category because there were some questions specifically about books that are more, um, books that are more suited for self-publishing, that idea that there are some genres or categories that work better. So there's the question. Do certain genres lend themselves to either traditional or self-publishing? What say you? Michelle, we'll start with you this time. Um, that's a great question. I, you know, I work on nonfiction, like I said. So I, when I think of books, nonfiction titles that work best for for self-publishing, I do go back to that idea of somebody who's using, either somebody who's using the, the book as a piece of their business and something that they want to um, use, you know, it's a speaker who wants to have a book to help open the door and get and, and build that business. Some, um, somebody, or, you know, or somebody who has a very personal story that they want to write. Sometimes that could be a great self-publishing candidate too. You know, you've got to get your story down and you want to share it with your family and your, and your loved ones. And that, and that's, that's sort of a, a starting point. Um, and, and then the nonfiction, or the fiction realm, I'm less personally um, experienced. So I might hand that question over to Carolyn, to you. Um, I totally agree with you with the nonfiction stuff. I think that the idea of like, if you are trying to get speaking engagements, it's fantastic. If you have self-published a nonfiction version kind of of your talk and you could hand those out for free or you could do, give them, you know, sell them for $2, it's all at reinforcing your brand, right? And, you know, if you're with a traditional publisher, you only get so many copies of that book for free, right? And then you're paying for them. So, um, you know, when you're self-publishing, you have a lot more control over price um, and, and, and you're the one deciding, um, you know, whether you're giving it out for free or not. So I've definitely seen a lot of people do that, exactly as Michelle was saying, if you've got other stuff you're selling. As far as fiction goes, my experience, you know, so far is that uh, genre fiction tends to sell best if you're doing Amazon and you're trying to sell Kindle books and you're trying to do well on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, now, Kindle Unlimited is the monthly subscription service. It's like Netflix. I think it's about $11 now. And that's where, you know, Kindle subscribers pay $11 and then they can read all that they want all month. And I was hesitant about doing KU because if you sign up to do Kindle Unlimited, you cannot have your ebook on any other 
platform. I cannot sell my book on iTunes, uh, Kobo. Like I, I can't sell it anywhere else, right? It can only be on Amazon because they are, you know, the monster machine. Um, but I now make the largest amount of my income is from KU. And when I was, so someone asked me to repeat the name of my hybrid publisher. That was She Writes Press. It's all women. It's for women by women. Um, and I have this trilogy, Time Zero, Time Zero, Time Next, and Time's Up. And the first book was still with She Writes Press, and I did the other two on my own. I ended up taking back the copyright of the first one because She Writes Press did not want to let me put the first book into KU. I eventually talked them into doing it and because they were like, oh, we don't think it's really worthwhile. We haven't had any of our authors do it. And then once I did it, they still had control of the, the back end. Um, how do I even say this? Um, you guys, I never talk at 841 anymore. I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> my COVID schedule, I'm like 840, what? 940 for Michelle, so. Oh, Michelle, you're a, <laughs> you're a star. I'm like, okay. anyway. The back end, uh, like the tech part of it, right? That allows me to advertise on Facebook and Amazon and say, hey, my book's on KU. Hey, my book is free. I didn't have access to that because She Writes Press did, right? Uh -huh. So um, anyway, I got my copyright back. And now, like I said, that's my biggest source of income from those three books. So when you look at um, Kindle Unlimited, would you say that you see certain trends in terms of, and I hate the word trend, so ignore that I said that, but do you see certain genre categories that are, that seem to be dominating or is it? So that's what I was going to say, so kind of wild about this whole space is that people who do really, really well, honestly, I think who do the best with self-publishing are really the ones who um they really are doing a ton of eBooks, right? They're not selling in general, like a million paperback copies, right? They're selling a million eBooks and they're selling them very cheap because it doesn't cost you anything to uh, sell it. You're not, you're not to pay to print it, right? People who do the best are romance writers killing it in the self-publishing field, right? They do really, really well. And now Kendall Unlimited has introduced its own section, its own separate, subscription service just for romance. I think it's $6.99 and it's all the romance you can read because there are so many um, readers and authors just within that category. Romance does great and that means romance and erotica. Sci-fi does amazing and then within sci-fi there are all these sub-genres, right? There's like, um, you know, military sci-fi is a huge genre. Um, there might be mil oh, military romance is a subgenre sub of romance. Um, so where, let me interrupt you and just say, yeah. um, where are you looking? So for the folks who are, who are listening in tonight, where yeah. are you finding just that for someone who's writing a particular kind of book? I know someone on the chat was asking about historical romance, um, or historical fiction. Where are you figuring out what those categories are that seem to be doing well? Are you looking at the bestseller list within Kindle? Yeah. Are you... When you go to Amazon, you can look both at um, what is what the number one books in Kindle, Kindle Unlimited are within your own genre, and then just what they are overall, right? Okay. But the also the secret here, though, is do you have more than one book? Do you plan to have more than one book, right? And again, this is within this sort of certain type of selling um, on Amazon, which is like, I have three books in this series, right? So the idea is that if I get someone hooked onto the first one, that they will read the next two so that I can maybe sell the first one for 99 cents and the next two for a bit more. Um, some people maybe give away their first book and then they charge for the rest in the series, but maybe the rest of the series is six books long, right? I am not a fast writer. There are some people out there that now write a book a month, which is so not me. I write a book every year and a half. Um, and um, the romance writers and the sci-fi writers who can pump it out every two months or whatever, they blow me away, but they, they seem to do pretty well. Some people do well with little novellas. 
once they have a following and people really like their writing. I think that if you have, if you're like, I'm going to write literary fiction, right? And they're going to be standalone novels. I think it would be difficult to self-publish and do that kind of model. Right. The model I'm talking about is I advertise on Facebook, right? Um, and I don't advertise on Amazon for whatever reason. I don't get great results from that. Some people have fantastic results. Well, and we're going to get to promotion after this because we're going to we're going to move to that. So I want to just finish the genre and category okay. part. So of all it. this to say, I do think it's what, here the category thing. I think it's hard to do literary fiction. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think if you wrote, uh, um, what am I thinking of? A Little Life. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think if you wrote A Little Life and you were like, I'm going to sell this online and I, it's, I'm going to kill it, I think it'd be really, really hard sell. Just right? for anyone who doesn't know, it's like a 600 page book <laughs> and it's very much literary exactly. fiction, but oh, also right. just- it's, it's beautifully beautifully written but it's just like you cry and you cry and it's just heart-wrenching right and it was a huge book I mean the year it came out it was a bestseller right New York Times bestseller really greatly reviewed but if one you know if that author had tried to sell that online and you know advertise it or whatever it is it would have been a really rough sell and you know trying to get people to buy it in paperback and I'm just that would have been really rough um, it's also hard. I'm answering this in advance because I know someone did ask this about middle reader. Mm -hmm. Kids stuff can be tough because that age is, they're not online and they're not looking at advertising. I mean, they're getting younger and younger online, but because I have a middle reader book. So then you're having to advertise to the parents and you're not getting to them directly. Um, so I also find that to be a little more difficult. So just, that's also a heads up. If it's a series that's going to help, but um, I do find, like, I think picture books would be very, very difficult, right? Because you're not, you're not getting a crowd that's really passionate and going, oh, bye, 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 right? Um, you're having to go through the, the party of the parent to, to get to it. Right. A lot of those things you're talking about, Carolyn, are like the, rev it's sort of the difference between if it's a review driven book, I think, you know, like the literary fiction, you know, the stuff that you want to, that, yes. that you need reviews driven versus, if, you know, a lot of, in the book publishing industry, a lot of us have lamented in the last couple of years that um, what we call the mass market books, the mm -hmm. category has collapsed. Those are the, the small format paperbacks that you would find in the drugstore or right. the, the, the paperback, paper dime store, dime store paperback. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The, the, or the airport paperbacks, right? Like, and um, those that has gone down tremendously, but I think it's because and it's a lot of those were genre fiction. Yep. You know, the, the, those are the mysteries, the romances, and a lot of that stuff I think has migrated online. Yeah. And so you're seeing so it's just exactly those categories that you're talking about that are working so well in yeah. E. Um, that that the, a lot of those readers I think have just you know if you're traveling in the airport maybe you're going to load up a book on, or two on your, a romance or two on your Kindle rather than um, shopping in the airport store. So I think right. that that's we're seeing sort of like it's a lot of that's driven by consumer trends. It's which is yeah. really interesting. I'm glad you mentioned that that idea of yeah review driven versus really consumers having an appetite for many 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 books in a genre or by a particular author. No, I think you're both totally right there. And this might be um, here's the middle grade question. So I think uh, we sort of covered that. It sounds like a uh, young adult though um, is a category in in self-publishing that can work and that you well, obviously most of my readers are actually adults oh so, yeah so my, i sell paperbacks to the actual teenagers but uh online my ebooks and my ku my kindle unlimited reads are all from women 35 and above so how do you sell the paperbacks can you talk just briefly about that process for uh you know you have your own press um, you're publishing now all three books in your trilogy, right? Um, so how, I mean, I'm sure this is a very big question, but how does that work? How does someone They're go? Print on demand. Hmm? They're print on demand. Print on demand, okay. Through KDP, um, does print on demand. So that means that I don't have to pay in advance to have thousands of books printed and then store them in a warehouse and then have them mailed out every time someone orders them. So that, that was a real game changer, right? When, when 
uh, companies started offering print on demand. The downsides of print on demand are it's, it's much more expensive, right? It costs a lot more per book than if I did order 2000 books at a time, right? It would be several dollars cheaper per book. So you're definitely losing income there. Um, and then, so I do it through KDP. So that's Amazon's self-publishing arm. I also do print on demand through Ingram Spark. Mm -hmm. And I do that because Ingram Spark allows people to buy at a discount if they are a school um, or they're a bookstore, right? And bookstores in general do not want to buy from Amazon because Amazon wants to destroy them. So if I'm going to have my release party at Book People, say, Book People wants to order from Ingram. They do not want to order from Amazon. So I always make sure that I have it being printed at at both those places so that bookstores and people are not forced to order from Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, and also so they can get that discount so they can get the proper school bookstore discount. So it would be good to, um, yes, yeah, someone said and Amazon Direct Publishing and Ingram Spark. It's, it's good to do both. Excellent, thank you. All right, so then we're gonna talk a little bit about the traditional route. Um, there were some questions specifically about uh, traditional publishing. So if you are a first time author, does it make sense to go the traditional route rather than have to learn numerous tasks that are new to the author? What's the trade off regarding royalties? I think you both can probably speak to this, but I wanted to start with this question to just give um, Michelle a chance to maybe briefly talk about what what does that mean when you are when a publisher acquires a book what does that exactly mean you know is it you tell us what does that mean well yeah so on its most basic level everyone's heard of the term advance and what an advance truly is is an advance against royalties so I find an amazing book I get the okay from my publishing team that I want to acquire it. And let's say I um, have been able to offer an advance of $25,000 um, worth author's thrilled, she accepts, and um, I will you know, pay that out in installments. But, but what I'm really paying is that the first book that is sold, the author is not going to immediately receive royalties um, day one, what, what that advance is an advance against royalties. And so the typical royalties, and these are very standard and pretty unmovable, um, at least across the, the big five are, a, a, on hardcovers, you'd be making 10% on the first 5,000, 12.5% on the, on the next 5,000, 15% thereafter. Um, that's of on the cover the, price, right? Of the cover price. Of the cover price. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep. Of the full covers. Um, and that ten percent goes towards the advance. That's right. And so every so let's say it's a okay, I'm gonna be math math here. So if it's a twenty dollar book, ten percent of that is two bucks. Um, the two the two bucks goes back towards that twenty five thousand dollars that I offered it as an advance. And so the author has to earn back that advance through book sales, through ebooks, through all formats through any royalties um, or any, any, any other monies. And once that $25,000 is recouped, plus a, we, um, there is what they call reserve against returns. So, um, you know, we've shipped out 100,000 copies, but we know that a few of those are gonna come back. And so we're not gonna pay royalties on that whole 100,000 copies day one. Um, but eventually after the advance is recouped and after, um, uh, you know, some the reserve is then royalties happen. But usually, unless you're, you know, um, Suzanne Collins or something, you know, you you probably are going to be even her probably, but her less. She got, she got paid a very hefty advance. Um, you're going to be. It, it does take usually some time for the the future payments go. So so that advance becomes very important. Um, and if it's if I saw someone pop up, what if it's a flop? You get to keep that twenty five thousand dollars even if I only sell you know five copies. Um, but the hope is that we can keep that advance, that everyone can make money, that, um, that we can uh, recoup our investment, that you can make a lot of royalties so that we can have, a, the authors are, can have a long career and that everyone can continue to, um, to prosper. And that we can pay $50,000 for book two and, well, and so on and so forth. And I think that goes back to the conversation about 
you know, when you're acquiring, thinking about comparison titles and really, and especially working at a publishing house like Penguin Random House, which is the largest publisher in the world, you have access to actual sales numbers for a lot of the books that exist, right? So you are able to create a a, a PL from the start that is based on actual expectation for sales. Is that yeah, right? it, absolutely. I mean, that's why I, we were talking about comparative titles earlier, and I really, um, you know, it's a it's a educated guess that um, that we're making when we acquire a book about you know here are some other books in this category that have and here's what they've sold. Um, here are uh, some other stats to talk about how people are really, really care about this issue. And that, you know, and that and we can sort of feed all that in and cross our fingers and wish upon a star and hope that we're gonna, and, and, and imagine what, what we think that we can sell in a, in a year or two's time. And we'll build our offer off of that, that number. So it's, it's guesswork, but it's it really, it's, it's slightly, it's definitely informed and educated. And um, if we guess right enough of the time, I get to keep my job and <laughs> do them print as well. <laughs> well, and I would I would just say while we're talking about the traditional side of things, that one thing that uh, you know what I what I did for many years in my job in publishing was sell subsidiary rights. So that's another thing that you know for all of you um, who who go the agent and then traditional publishing route, just understanding who has control of whatever rights you know there are, meaning who's going to publish, who's going to sell the rights for a French publisher to translate your book in French, and who's going to um, sell audio rights or any number of other things, um, that those are additional ways that you can uh, earn back that advance, but then also as an author, either with your agent selling directly, or if you're doing it yourself, um, that's also another source of income for for your property. So. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, like, yeah. In the, ten years ago, eBooks started, um, you know, se- really working and selling, and that became a bigger and bigger percentage of authors' rights, whether particularly in traditionally published, but I think probably in both um, through through both paths. Um, audio in the last couple of years has been the big star in um, in our group, and um, that, that's those sales have just been growing and growing year upon year in an industry that's overall rather flat and steady. Like audio has been growing as a huge percentage of that. Um, so those are all, at my company, we have to um, acquire audio book rights as part of a, a part of the book rights that we, we have to acquire ebook and we have to acquire audio. It's just not, a, it's a, it's a, um, we're quite firm on that. Um, other places have different um, ways of splitting that up and, um, and you're right. And it's there's there's value in the tr- in the translation. There's value in the audio. There's value in the ebook. And those are all ways that that authors can make can make money from their books. That we can all make money. From I actually books. just got I got the audio rights back from Simon and Schuster for my middle grade book. Did you? I was going to ask you what you've done or I, what you are yeah. going to do with audio. Yeah, it took me a year to get them. Not because I feel like they were so resistant. It was just sort of getting through the red tape to get mm-hmm. to like all the right people. Uh, but yeah, they hadn't done anything with them. They, you know, they hadn't turned it into an audible book. And so ultimately I just wrote and asked and said, you know, I would like these back cause I want to use them. Um, and like I said, a year later, they finally said yes and gave me back the rights. So, uh, um, what are you going to do with those Carol? And how are you going to, um, I've already made it into, I already made it into an audible book. I used, um, awesome. uh, found a fantastic narrator. She did such a terrific job. Uh, I love it. I love the book. Cool. Um, yeah, I feel a little bit like it's in, it's been an interesting switch. So I also I also had Time Zero uh, made into an audible with a different narrator, and she's finishing up the second book now. And Time Zero is doing well. I feel like with um, the Lost Children, because it's middle reader, I was really counting on road trips. Oh, like spring break road trips oh yeah and summer road trips like it's a perfect kind of in the car with the family mm-hmm. so the timing's not great but i one of the things i've learned also is to be very patient you know that lost children came out in 2010 you know it's been 10 years and the book still has a life you know so you're just sort of like you just kind of don't know what the season they're different seasons for the book right different things happen with it yep. um 
And oh gosh, there was something else. I have a oh. feeling there are parents right now turning to audiobook. Yeah. Or... <laughs> I know. And also the truth is I haven't been advertising it that much. It's just something I need to do. Um, but I was also going to say, if you self-publish, you also can pick and choose what, what you want people to represent, right? So even though I, you know, own all of my copyright, you know, last year I assigned with an agent to represent my, you know, international rights and film rights and audible rights because that I don't have those connections, right? So I didn't want him to sell it um, domestically, but I wanted him to try and do all those other things for me. So there really is some picking and choosing you can do now as everything is changing. I mean, I will say, I think that's hard to get an agent who's going to, that can be a challenge. And I, I don't know if you can offer any insight into how you did that. Was it a, was it just uh, writing a query letter to agents or did I you? Actually, I, confess, I mean, that was actually, he came to me because his daughter read time zero at school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he approached me. I mean, not to discourage people from trying it, but I do think that it can be, um, it can be hard to do. I mean, yeah. that's wonderful. I think that's true, but I also, you know, I think that I'm getting ahead of our questions, but someone was asking about, you know, what, have there been really successful books that are self-published, you know? And I was like, okay, well, um, 50 Shades of Grey is probably the most successful, right? Um, so that started as fan fiction and then was traditionally published. And The Martian started out self-published. And I think- I didn't realize that, oh. Yeah, yeah. and I think that, you know, it, what is common now is that if the industry sees that there is a book that's just selling through the roof that, um, you know, you will be approached. Right. And um, I don't know if you know about, know about Michael Bunker, who's, mm -hmm. He's Texan. He comes into Austin frequently to talk to the Indie Author Society, which is something you guys should check out. It's on, it's a meetup group, meetup.com, Indie Author Society, um, lots of um, different uh, workshops on how to indie publish. And he comes and talks and he writes Amish sci-fi. So if you want to get more specific than that, I don't know how you can. He writes Amish sci-fi. He's incredibly successful. And he's been in a lot of news articles as this example of a successful indie, pub, uh, indie publisher because he was offered, someone said, hey, I'll pay you $5,000 advance for this book. And he was like, I make $5,000 a week. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, because he Is doesn't his, Will you say his name again? Michael Bunker. Michael Bunker. I'm writing it in the um, chat. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to keep going because we have a lot of questions, um, but I hope you'll forgive me if I interrupt. Um, I've self-published two novels and I have a children's book manuscript that I believe is better published using traditional channels. Do I need an agent versus querying editors directly? Pros and cons of each approach. Um, so they weren't specific about what type of children's book. I'm almost assuming that it might be picture book for some reason. I don't know why I'm assuming that, but um, what do either of you have? I mean, I can say as a former agent that if you're going to go to traditional, the big five traditional publishers, you probably are going to need an agent to approach them. I mean, certainly some editors, Michelle, you could speak to this, will buy books that uh, they hear about elsewhere or from the author directly, but more often than not, especially when you're working in one of the genres, I would assume that you're going to need an agent for that. Um, anything else you'd want to add to that idea of like going of deciding to go the traditional route in terms of querying editors directly? There might be a little more permeability in ability to sort of go directly is in the children's genre, maybe a little bit um, in the adult, the adult, um, Right now, it is pretty set up to go have go through agents. I thought I saw a, a question pop up about asking about resources for finding um, agents or finding those editors, maybe. Um, and I always point, the first place I always point folks to, and maybe this is already something that you're pressing on your membership, Becca, is Publishers Marketplace, um, which is this amazing database of deals, um, usually from big five and also um, um, 
more independent places. And basically people write in and say what the book is, what category it is, who the editor was and who the agent was. And it's just amazing resource. There, there is a, a membership fee. I think it's something like $15 a month. And sometimes I recommend people. dollars a month. Yeah, 25 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. I, sometimes I recommend people to, if they just to like sign on, if they're available, if they're able to for like one month and do a bunch of research and then, you know, and, and their thing, but it's, it really is valuable. And if it can pinpoint like, if you are at the point in your process where you're ready to reach out to an agent and do some research and you, you can search by category, you can search by keyword, you can figure out, and it's, it's great to look for those comp titles and by extension to find your way to the agents and editors who are doing exactly the kind of stuff that you're doing in, in this, in the more traditional publishing realm, if that's, if that's where you want to go. Yeah. And they always say like the, the really good hint is, um, as well as most, well, almost every author will thank their agent in their, um, uh, oh my God, you guys, what's wrong with me tonight? In the accomplishments. <laughs> <laughs> the only one that was coming to me was accomplishments. In their accomplishments. I mean, it is their accomplishment as well, but yes. Yeah, again. Yeah, where I can write a whole sentence in a novel. Yeah. Okay, in their acknowledgments, this is really yeah. good. In their acknowledgments, Nine times out of 10, um, a, a writer will thank their agent and their editor. Um, and so it's a really good idea if you're trying to figure out uh, who represents them. If you're like, oh, this book is comparable, or I love this book, this is kind of like my voice. That's how you can find out who represents them. Yeah, acknowledgements are a great way. Query trackers getting a lot of love right now um, on the chat bot, from the chat box. So for sure, there's uh, there are a lot of great resources out there. I'll also mention that we did an Ask Us Anything on query letters and on querying agents. Um, so you can find that on our YouTube channel. It's another recording similar to this one that is focused solely on the querying process. So check that out for sure to you guys. Um, so this was interesting. What steps, if any, should you take to market yourself before signing with an agent? So I guess, you know, Michelle and Carolyn, can you think of any tips you would offer to writers on how, as they're finishing up the manuscript, as they're getting, you know, to the point where they're going to query, what are the things they could do, be doing? What sort of, um, another word I hate, platform, um, would you suggest they be building? And I think there is a real difference between fiction and nonfiction for this, but um, what, are the, what are the tips that you would give? Um, for that, oh, 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 Michelle. No, 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 you go, you jumped in. <laughs> um, from, I would say for, I, I am a nonfiction editor, but I work with a lot of fiction, um, at a fiction imp a, a imprint that does a ton of fiction. And um, I have a guest in my background there. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Zoom, guys. <laughs> um, so my my fiction colleagues really they care about the book. They care about the writing. They ca they can you know they're really less if if someone happens to um, you know have a Twitter handle that goes, that's out of control or something like they, that's wonderful. That's bonus. But they really care about the book, and they they also care about figuring out how to categorize and sell that book. So if it's a you know upmarket historical fiction in the vein of the light we lost the, you know, the, like, the, it, having those comp tales and be able to talk about it in that way is um a really useful you know is, is more important than you know having a blog frankly <laughs> um for for them for me on the nonfiction side i it is a little more important for a lot of categories that some, if it's an expert-led category i do want somebody who has some expertise um in what they're doing, whether, you know, if it's a health book, they, hopefully they've got some health credentials. It does help in a lot of these folks, if they have, if somebody has built some kind of infrastructure around their expertise. But actually I was just thinking as you were talking, there's um, one, a, a self-published book that I acquired for traditional publishing after it had sold about 40,000 copies um, through self-publishing realms a few years ago. And it was this author, she was a, she was the most unlikely platform. She was a former circus acrobat turned potty training expert <laughs> and she had this self-published potty training book called wow. oh crap potty training and it was like a, she but it was all about she had a great voice and she had these real this method that like she'd work and she had like she actually had um at that point self-published book sold at 40,000 and she used facebook groups you know like people would like talk about you know parenting facebook groups you uh, someone and um it, 
it, had, it sort of became this word of mouth phenomenon. We acquired the book half, I think, because of the title of oh, crap potty training. We're like, this is great. And <laughs> it, it, it went on to be like this amazing success. And it was because, so she didn't have any, she didn't have a, um, you know, an MD in pedi pediatrics or anything like that, but she had a point of view and a great voice. And she was a real kind of like, she, she happened to be a real marketing genius herself, but she was really good at c connecting people and getting folks talking about her book. So that some of that's is innate. I think she was had an entrepreneurial spirit, which we were able to harness. Did she have an agent when you acquired that or did you hear she, about it? You know, that one was, was agented and the agent had heard about it because she said that all of her friends were talking about this book and her, her friends with, with kids were talking about this book. And so she, um, one of the, a friend had, had suggested she check it out. And she, this agent didn't have kids, but she, she knew a good thing when she saw it. And um, awesome. the rest is history. So. Thank you. Carolyn, what would you say about fiction for folks who are writing, whether it's YA or adult, um, anything you've observed about how to build that, build yourself? You know, people have a lot of different strategies. For a while, everyone was saying you should blog. But like Michelle said, I think if you write fiction, it doesn't matter if you blog. If you love blogging, do it. But for me, it just took away from my writing time and made me feel guilty. Like if I was blogging, I felt guilty I wasn't working on the novel. And if I was working on the novel, I felt guilty I wasn't blogging. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, that it's important maybe that, you know, if you have a book and it's it's gonna come out, I think it's really important to have your social media ready to go. You know, you don't have to have 50,000 followers, but I think that um, certainly if you're gonna self-publish, you need it ready to go. But I think that um, any publisher is gonna to want to know that you're ready to, you know, do a little a bit of your own self-promotion and they wanna know that you know how to open a Twitter account <laughs> or, you know, that you're, that you're savvy enough to do some basic stuff. but I really think it's about finding which platform you enjoy because you need to keep up with it, you know? And I'm guilty of not necessarily taking my own advice because I have a Twitter account, I have an Instagram account, I have Facebook. The truth is though, at the end of the day, I really like Facebook. I like having a picture and I like words, right? So with Twitter, I kind of miss a picture. With Instagram, I miss the words. But I think that if you choose one, you're going to be happier than if you try and do all of them kind of in a half-ass way. You know, some yeah. people love Pinterest. Oh my gosh. Um, I know a woman and she does a lot of research for her books and she wrote like, um, you know, like historical mysteries and she would put on Pinterest everything that inspired her, you know, like, Oh, here's a picture of the house that I used and here are the costumes that I looked up. And, you know, so she was very, very visual and she would allow her fans, you know, to see those inspiration boards. And I thought that was really cool, you know? So um, I think it really is about like, what do you find interesting and you think you will actually be able to keep up with? If it's going on Instagram and only taking pictures of your cats, do that because people love pictures of cats, you know? Like, I think it's about being authentic because that's the only way you will keep up with it is do something that's truly your voice and that you truly like doing. I love it. Thank you. That's great advice. All right. So now we're going to go to the do it yourself route. Uh, if I can make my slides. So, so here was the question. Please give us some examples of self-published books that became big sellers. And I know you mentioned uh, Michael Bunker. Michael right? Bunker. Right. And I said 50 Shades and, uh, yeah. and the, yeah. Martian, the Martian, I think. The Martian is really cool because when he started writing that, um, he was publishing it, I believe, like a chapter at a time. Mm. And he had so many, he, he grew this fan base and there were so many like engineers and scientists involved that they would correct him. Like, <laughs> he was getting advice as he went. And, you know, they would say, no, 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 that actually wouldn't work. He would have to, you know, he couldn't do that. He'd have to be this kind of oh my gosh. Um, like, or whatever. Nerd out it <laughs> and it made the book, you know, a hundred times better. Right. He said like his fans just made it, you know, uh, such a better book than it ever would have been. So I think that that's a really cool story. Um, In the chat box, they're talking about Hugh Howey wool. Oh yeah. Wool is a major one. Wool for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, the next question. 
All right, let's get into it. I'm sure there's a wide range, but can you give us an idea of how much self-publishing can cost? It definitely has a very wide range because you're talking about like everything from like the cover, right? There are so many programs now that are like, design your own cover on here, right? You could do that for free. Um, you could, you know, pay a little bit money for, for some stock photos. Um, you could pay someone cheap to do it um, and, you know, get it done for a hundred dollars. If you're going to actually pay someone who works for Simon and Schuster to do covers, you're going to pay $2,000, right? So <laughs> your cover could cost you anywhere between zero and $2,000, depending on what you have to spend and what you want. Maybe you have an, a, a friend who's an artist and who's fantastic. But at the same time, you have to remember that book design is very, very different than you know, web design. Um, so when you reach out to that friend, they really might not have any idea what they're doing. So I would suggest um, that you find someone who specifically does book cover design because there are people who do it really cheaply nowadays. Um, yeah, here you go. People are giving nice um, suggestions on the side here. There's also editing. And I think um, personally that you should not scrimp on editing. I think it's everything. There are many books being self-published now full of mistakes. Um, and the authors are sort of like, ah, I don't really care if you're and you're mixed up and <laughs> they're as mixed up. And that gives me a heart attack. Like I'm like, Ugh! like the fact <laughs> that they're going out with all these mistakes. But as I said, I take a year and a half to write a book. I don't write them in a month. Um, so I think it's very important that, and I, I did a panel recently on editing and the different kinds of editing. I think it's important that you have a story editor, um, that you have someone who's doing copy editing and then there's proofreading, right? There's like three different kinds of editing and it's a whole other panel, but, um, I think it's important to have all of them and you can have someone that does all three of those things. You can have two different people doing copy editing and proofreading. Um, I use Yellowbird and Austin. Um, they're fantastic. Um, but you know, that can end up costing you a thousand dollars if it's a 400 page book. Um, but you know, I think it can cost you more than that. I yeah. Mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's actually twelve hundred dollars. But I'm I'm also saying like when it when you're done, you're going to have a professional grade book, right? That is not riddled with mistakes and. Um, they have really excellent people there that are going to also give you really important, if you want story yeah. notes, you know, saying like, you know, this character is not consistent throughout the chapters or whatever you're looking for. So what else are you spending money on? You're spending money on the cover. You're spending money on editing. Yes. Um, are you spending money on marketing and promotion? Yeah. So that's what I was going to say too, is I spent money like in the beginning. Um, so there's, and I'll, I'll write this down. There's, I did a marketing um, class with this man, Mark Dawson, D-A-W-S-O-N. And he's sort of the guru right now of Facebook and Amazon ads and how to do them. And he, I really, I learned so much. I spent some money taking the class, but then it was about sort of like, okay, how do you spend money on Facebook ads? Um, and make money. And it took me a while, right? It took me a while to not be like just throwing <laughs> money, like, you know, yeah. throwing money down the drain. Um, and then I was breaking even, you know, it took me a while to, to be making money with that. But the truth is you can spend, you know, you can spend a dollar a day, you know, you can spend $2 a day on Facebook ads to see what's going to work and what's not going to work. It's sort of whatever your budget is. Um, I love the advice of going and finding someone who has figured that out because I do yes. think that there it is possible to throw a lot of money at certain ads um, like Facebook and other places. And because you don't understand how all of that works, you're not getting a bang for your buck. So I think yeah. And someone just put Mark Dawson self-publishing formula. That's it. And someone else is also saying they don't want people to be discouraged by such enormous price tag. I'm not saying that all editors are going to charge you $1,200 at all. I'm just saying that I do think it's worthwhile to find a good editor to work on your book. Because if you've spent all of this time and you want to get it out in the world and you want it to do well, you also need to go through 
the professional steps. And I will say that for me, the advantage of having been traditionally published is I went through all of those steps with Simon and Schuster and I know what they are and I knew what they did for my book, right? The difference between it before that process and after. <clears throat> and when I worked with the hybrid publisher, I saw the steps that they skipped and I made them go back and do them. Right. And I wouldn't have known that if I had not been traditionally published. Well, and I'm glad you're saying this, too, because I think that sometimes, I mean, it's important to have this conversation to talk about the costs that are associated, but also as a reminder that there, there are things that traditional publishers do, like someone like Michelle Howry, her time and her expertise editing that is, that contributes to the process, right? Um, so if you're not going to go the traditional route, then you still, you can't skip those. Well, you can, you can do whatever you want, but you ideally won't skip those pieces of it and you'll still um, get the sort of editorial eye or the cover design or what have you that you need. We're going to keep going because we, uh, we are we are behind on our questions, but that's okay. Um, so I'm a multi-published global author, but my NYC agent and I have had problems placing a highly topical Austin border murder mystery because of all the changes in traditional publishing. I'm seriously considering Amazon's Kindle Direct Publishing. I welcome our panelists' thoughts on KDP, which I know you touched on KDP um, earlier, but is there anything else you want to talk about in terms of um, Kindle direct publishing, Carolyn, as a refresher for? Well, I, don't, I mean, I'm not exactly, I'm not sure which issue to cover here. I mean, this idea that it's, it is the problem because it's a highly topical Austin border murder mystery? Or I, think the, I, I honestly think that the main question is considering Kindle Direct Publishing um, right. because we can't answer the question of, yeah, like the probably the, the project itself, right? Right. right. Um, well, yeah, Amazon, KDP is what I was saying is, is really what I used, um, that that's my main uh, publisher and they do my print on demand for my paperbacks and um that's who does my ebooks and you do kindle unlimited through kindle direct publishing okay um so I you're that. happy you're happy with what you're what I you're am. and i was going to get an example so um michelle do you want to feel this for a second i was going to get an example of a, a book published with them and then one not okay <laughs> Carolyn's going. Michelle, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> what would you say, no, in all seriousness, right now, um, you know, we're talking about changes in traditional publishing, I guess, can you just speak from the editorial point of view of, you know, what, for someone who's never been published before, what does that look like in an editorial meeting when a project is brought up by somebody who's never been published before and what kinds of, you know, considerations are publishers making? And is it, has it changed a lot in the last 10 years or is it still, you know, the same except just a lot fewer editors, I would guess. You know, I think that, you know, again, especially on, on fiction, I think on nonfiction, there is a higher bar of folks having building a little bit of their own audience, you know, and bringing, helping bring that to help, help elevate the book and reach, and reach folks. And on the fiction side, I, I, it's, that's less, but I think, you know, you said that trends earlier, that trends is a dirty word and I totally agree with you, but there are, you know, we're, a lot of times we are, we're trying to lead the market. But we're also following the market and, and looking at seeing, you know, what's working and trying to amplify and do more of that. So, you know, some years like you know right now we're in a sort of on, on the adult side we're in a kind of book clubby uh for a few years there was a um a suspense kind of a, a, a woman on the train kind of a genre like vibe right and i feel like we're still people we're still seeing a lot of that maybe it's tapering a little bit there's now we're really into my, my fiction colleagues are really into sort of like rom-com which is sort of like what romances have, have evolved into in the last couple of years you know it's a little bit light light kind of contemporary romance they're calling rom-com so it's like what a lot of times we are seeing those trends and um look and we're quite reactive so i mean we try to be, try to be proactive but we can also be reactive so you know it might just be that at the moment you know 
this is working more than a military history was, which were the words that was five, you know, so that's, I think sometimes that, that, that can be what, really frustrating for authors because they, you know, that I understand and that might, so um, we try and be open and be forward looking, but that could be a reason if um, to think about striking out on one's own too, I would imagine, right? If, if, if you know, there's an audience out there. I'm not sure that um, as a traditional publisher, I knew that, um, Am what was it, Amish? Uh, Amish um, sci-fi. I was sci-fi, but like that's amazing that, that, that they know that he's found his his uh, tribe of readers and has like delved into that. You know, so I think I think oftentimes I think we can learn a lot from looking at what traditional publishing may have missed, right? And and it can it's really exciting to see that um, there are that folks are finding their audience in different, many different ways through many different paths. Well, and I think that too, it's good for authors to, or writers to remember that, you know, the, the process that you went through to find the right agent, um, which was all very subjective, right? Depending on who you happen to put your query letter in front of on what day and what they were already reading and what clients they had just taken on, that then your agent in turn is turning around and having that same experience with, um, with the with editors you know so it may be that a particular editor in a house just isn't feeling that book right now because they just bought another book last week that was very similar so that's why unfortunately that process also can take a while and you might have your book your agent may submit to you 25 editors, 30 editors, and circle back to some houses because another editor left and now they're gonna send it to a fresh person. And it's just, again, like the way that Carolyn started this, I think is so true. Like it's none of it's fast <laughs> and, and yeah. having patience and really just, you know, letting the process evolve as it has to evolve is important, but. Show us your show us your books. You have some props. Oh, I now. do. So I do have props. So I was going to say this was um, this is she writes press, type zero right. So 2016 before I took the copyright back, but this is book two, and that's my self published KDP, print on. This is print on demand, right? Right, so, and they're basically the same, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, right. So I just wanted to show you, like you know, awesome. that no one who buys. Oh. The two books or sees in the bookstore knows the difference, right? Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no reason for anybody to, you know, to be like, oh, well, you know, that one's, that one's traditional or this one's not or whatever, right? They, it, they look fantastic. Kindle, Kindle yeah. he does a really, really good job. I love um, it. The other thing I was going to say, the reason I asked about this, genre, you know, Austin Border murder mystery is because we didn't actually ever really get around to the reason I ended up not going after the big five for time zero was because not only was it dystopian and this was um so let's say this is like 2012 or so i my agent basically told me dystopian was over um and you know this was eight years ago um eight years of dystopian later anyway but he was <laughs> like yeah i think just you know dystopian is just kind of done um so he wasn't excited about it and i knew wasn't going to get really, you know, ramped up to sell it. And then I was like, well, if, and then the editors aren't gonna be terribly excited about it. Um, and the other thing is that I wrote about fundamentalist religion and I wrote about many fundamentalist religions. And I also knew when he kind of started to show it around that it was making people uncomfortable. So I think the other thing that you to think about if you are considering self-publishing is maybe you're writing something that, I don't know, makes people uncomfortable. And ultimately what's crazy to me now, it's, it's hard for me to look back and think, wow, I, I wrote these three books and I didn't have to censor anything. And there's a lot in it that I think if I'd had uh, an editor, because it's YA, um, and because again, my experience with Simon and Schuster that had me, you know, remove stuff so it could be in Scholastic Book Club. I don't know that I would have been able to leave everything in that I wanted to. And mm -hmm. I felt very, very free um, to explore these extremist religions and, and say what I wanted to say about them um, because uh, I was doing it myself. So I think there is something to be said about, like if, if, if you're doing a topic that you feel like people are just kind of like, well, it's over or, 
I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Or, you know, I mean, it's what people were saying about LGBTQ, like for a long time, no one wanted to be publishing that, or they didn't know if those romance stories would work. And then it had a huge underground following, right? It's huge on KU. So I think that's something else to consider. No, that's really good advice. Thank you. All right, we're gonna talk very quickly on promotion, um, really seeing if there are things that we haven't already hit on. Um, any tips on growing the audience using your website? Anyone have any brilliant tips for writers who are trying to get eyes on their website? There's, right now, I feel like the current, the current trend, sorry, Becca, <laughs> is really about the newsletter. And I don't, I don't know exactly how I feel about this, but it's like, you know, to have a, um, some sort of freebie or giveaway that, to get people to sign up to your newsletter, right? Um, whether it's a chapter of your book or a short story um, or a whole ebook or whatever, something that's not gonna cost you money. Yeah, or a contest, someone said. And then um, get a big mailing list. And then maybe instead of having a blog, um, have, you can have a weekly newsletter, you can have a monthly newsletter, whatever it is. For me, mine's monthly and I try and give something to them each time. Um, so it's not just to buy my book, buy my book. So I've given away a lot of free copies of my Audible book, like free codes, um, advanced looks at new releases, um, and yeah, contests of, well, okay, I'll give away, you know, some of the um, paperback copies. And in general, my newsletter is just, um, what I'm reading, what I'm watching. It used to be what I'm leaving the house for. That's no longer a category. Um, but yeah, so it, some, it needed to be something that was easy for me to write. Just kind of like as I was saying about the, the um, social media stuff, it needs to be something that you have fun writing because it, it, it took me a long time to figure out what my newsletter should be because um, and again, it needs to be your voice and some people are so good at it. But um, by doing that, I my my newsletter now, I think my, I got about 3,000 people, three or 4,000 people on my list um, by giving away free stuff. And I, I think that that's been the most successful thing for me. You know, and someone in the chat is making the comment, which is a great one, that when you're designing your website site, make sure that you also have a mobile version, uh, um, yeah. which feels like we're actually, the Writers League is um, designing a new website that'll be debuted sometime. Um, but yeah, the mobile, the mobile of it is really important, right? Because that's how we're all looking at things these days. Do you have any tips, Michelle, for that sort of promotion from what you've seen authors do, or is it pretty much similar? Yeah, I would say like, look at other, those, go back to those comp titles and those comp authors, see what they're up to, the great tips from those. You know, that is a part of the full service marketing publicity um, role that a traditional publisher like Putnam will, would would serve. And so we work really closely a lot. If an author is a first time author who has it, we'll often consult with them closely. Um, maybe even if have like a very basic website that's hosted at, if, by my company, if, but oftentimes I think it's good for, wise for authors to control um, that themselves. That's my preference for them, honestly. Um, but and I think more and more and more, they're, they're pretty basic. I mean, they don't have to be, have a lot of bells and whistles, but they should just have you know, it's, it's important to have like, have all the buy buttons, have all the buy buttons for your book, not just Amazon, you know, if, if it is available in different places, you know, it's just like little basic things that we advise authors to and help them sort of, you know, put your book cover up top, you know, just some very basic things that, but if you're doing it for the first do you time. Find, do you feel like most of your clients still um, hire their own PR people on top of you guys? Um, it depends. If, it, if an author has their own business that they're, um, again, you know, that, that, that's, that the book is, is come, comes out of. Some of them will have that just for something larger than the book. And we work really closely. If that happens, you know, we'll, we'll coordinate closely with, with them and, and, and to dive, divide up duties and places. And, you know, maybe our team will go for the national publicity and their team will go for the more regional stuff or whatever. But, um, but um, it's definitely not necessary, especially through, um, through um, traditional publishing. The idea is that we will be a full service Right. Uh, publish, do, do full service publicity for um, our books but when they come out. But also I think that in, you know, tell me if this is incorrect, but the other thing about for traditional publishing with regards to publicity is that 
there is a window of time when a publicist is going to be dedicated and focused on your book, but that window will close at some point, meaning, you know, there's what, like a three to four month window, would you say? That's, that's probably um, fair. And so mm -hmm. for some folks who, it, that it might be worth their while for some, for folks who feel like there's sort of throughout the year, different opportunities when they could be promoting themselves that it might be, I'm not a fan of telling people to spend money on extra things like outside publicists, unless they really, you know, can get some value from it. So those are the kinds of things you can think about is, is there something I want to do beyond the window of time when we really will be focusing on the publication of the book? Like, what's your goal? What do you want to get out? Do you really want to get, do, do a bunch of, of speaking next year and getting out and maybe a publicity or a person can help you do that. So, you know, I think it's good to have a really concrete goal. And um, do you guys have any suggestions on where someone can find recommendations for publicists? <laughs> Did you work with a publicist at all, Carolyn? Yeah, I have actually, I've, I've used the same really sweet couple in California, like since the lost children, I mean, you know, on and off when they're available and when I can. Um, um, it's okay if you don't have any recommendations. I mean, we're- I up with you. I'm like, she, no, sure. It's, I, there are a lot of different sources for, um, for publicists. And I think that now, I mean, with the, the indie kind of explosion, there, there are all sorts of people who will do it. Um, if, if anyone wants to, they can email me separately. I'm fine to share. I'm at, I'm at Carolyn at uh, Kids with Pens, or I'll put it here. I'm, I'm, I'm fine for anybody to email me. Um, I'll put well, and I'll also say that at the Writers League, we do have a resources section that lists some publicists that we're aware of, and we're adding into it all the time. So if anybody out there has recommendations for publicists, we also have freelance editors on there. If you are an editor and you wanna make sure you're listed, or if you have recommendations, send them our way too, because we'll update our website and make sure that, that you guys can um, take advantage of those different resources. So I think we sort of covered this, unless there's anything else you wanna say about self-promotion, traditional versus uh, self-publishing. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I just, like I said, I feel like I, I did a ton when I was with Simon and Schuster that I still, I, I mean, I remember talking to somebody in marketing and they were like, Oh, you know, we kind of, we have to do like five a day or something, you know, I mean, they, they had such a large load of books. Um, so, um, and they would sometimes hook me up with uh, bookstores, but you know, no one would come. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I learned that schools really were much, much better for me. And I sold many more books at schools. So well, I and for the kids project. market, especially, right? Yeah, I'm just saying that it, yeah. it's still, that no one's going to sell as many books as you. And, and uh, you know, all, at the end of the day, no one cares as much as you do. It's just like being the parent of a child, right? It's like, you know, other people love your child, but it's all, you're always going to be, you know, you're always mom. So I, I just feel like, um, you know, that, um, you're constantly thinking about it and you're constantly trying to think of angles, you know? So, um, yeah, I, but yeah, there's, there's self-promotion no matter what you do, but I think that Beck, Becca's right. I mean, I think that if you're going to self-publish, there's a certain entrepreneurial spirit that you, you absolutely have to have. Yeah. And I think that, um, Michelle, you would probably, I would imagine, agree with that, that, but on the traditional side too, that authors really are, it's a partnership. And while publishers are going to do what publishers are going to do and that they are going to dedicate a publicist and some marketing people that you also as an author have, have to be prepared to step up and promote. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think uh, I was thinking back to something you said about that window of the, which is absolutely true is that there is sort of a, a window at right before pub through pub that you know this book is is front list and it's it's being pushed but one of the interesting things that we have been um hearing and you know the last three months um of covid has sort of accelerated a lot of trends that we were already seeing towards people buying through online outlets not just amazon um but like people going to target.com and martinsnoble.com and a lot of other walmart.com a lot of other um bookshop.com, you know, like uh, people's, so a lot of online reach um, or, and on, online, there is very little difference between a book that came out last week and a book that came out 10 years ago. 
you know, it's all front list. And that's, and that's been this like key learning that we as a company have been talking about a lot. And so there are way, you know, the, our, a number, we had a number one New York times bestseller a month, a week ago, a couple weeks ago, um, that was published like 12 years ago. It was this book about the 1917 influenza that my colleagues at Penguin uh -huh. books published, you know, and so it, be it became this book that everyone wanted to read because it was in the news, of course. And so I think, and that's an extreme example, but there was another example from, um, psychic, Sylvia Brown that was published like 10 years ago like a, in a called End of Days and it was like this backlist book that was selling like five copies a week and it set up and sold hundreds of copies a week because people just sort of found it in this moment when they needed it and um, so we're seeing that there I think there's lots of opportunities to um, yeah. make your book a new again. And Becca I don't know did you see what ha happened to Time Zero last month? No. Like, this crazy thing happened. So um there was a New York Times article about what famous people are reading. Oh, yes, I did see this. Tell everyone. <laughs> well, Time Zero was on Amy Poehler's bookshelf. <laughs> and it was right behind her head. And guys, when we're talking about the importance of a book cover, I'm telling you the only reason that the New York Times guy put it was because this is so big. Yeah. It's like massive. And I had seen her on Seth Meyers. Someone else had already like emailed me and said, oh my God, it, you know, look at Amy Poehler on Seth Meyers because it was right behind her head. So this book came out four years ago and it has a whole new life. It's like selling better than it ever did. That is really a cool. random thing, you know, that happened. So what you're saying is we should all get our books to Amy Poehler. Yes. <laughs> Come on. I don't know. What, how, how can I be any clearer? I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I know there are so many celebrities who feel very like urgently want us all to know that they have large bookshelves with a lot of books on them because they are, they are zooming right in front of their bookshelves. But that was very cool that that happened to you. I love it. Um, all right. We talked about websites already. So we're going to keep going. Um, we talked about traditional publishing. Yes, absolutely. They have access to reading groups and, and focus on reading groups for fiction. Um, so we talked about this a little bit, right? About um, having a blog right now. It feels like it's not as urgent a need, but I think what you said, Carolyn, is worth saying again, and that was just figure out what works for you, what makes you happy, what yeah, teaches you. Newsletter, but, you know, if you're better at Twitter, do Twitter, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, so really briefly, um, I guess talking, and you talked about this too, I think, Carolyn, just the idea of these different types of editors that you might want and that it's not just proofreading, but it's also um, developmental or story editing. And really, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan too of shopping around, meaning, you know, talk to a few different people, find someone who feels like, you know, you connect with them. Maybe they'll read some of your pages ahead of time and give you their feedback so that you can see if it's a good fit. And we can help you um, certainly help you figure out. I always have, I have a beta reader. And I think that once you find that person, it's like they're worth their weight in gold, which is a friend. I don't think it should be family. It should not be your best friend because they'll either be too nice or it's just too loaded. Family is loaded, right? They just say things and somehow it, it, it sounds a lot worse or a lot better to you than it should. So yeah. um, it just needs to be someone that you trust who's just a really avid reader or another writer. Um, but yeah, who is, whether it's they're reading it chapter by chapter or um, yeah, reads that rough draft or whatever it is, I think it's really important that you have someone reading it as you go along before you get to the paid stage. Yeah. It'll save sure. you. I'm also a big fan of reading, of writing writers groups. Yeah. Um, I'm actually publishing two authors from the same writers group. <laughs> um, what? And I, I published one, one of her books, one woman's book like five or six years ago. And they, she got her agent from her writers group. Oh. And I bought the, I bought her friend's book without knowing that they were uh, connected. Uh, be very fraught. <laughs> yeah. Michelle, you know. Two people are going to be talking about you a lot in the coming months. <laughs> I actually think it may have given, I think I had a really nice experience with the first author and we, we really got along well. So I think it may have given me a little leg up when I tried, when I bought the second book, but um, yeah, you're right. It could, it could backfire. <laughs> Gotta watch my step. <laughs> you never know. All right. We're going to skip that one because I think we did talk about quality and editing. Um, 
So I'll just uh, jump in for this one. There were questions that were a little outside of the topic, but were still, I thought, might be helpful for people. So my children's book has illustrations that I'm unable to create. I believe that I can submit the manuscript without illustrations and the publisher will secure artwork. What is the process? So I thought I would just say that, um, yes, like picture books are often, uh, uh, submitted, that's what you're expected to submit is the manuscript and then publishers find an illustrator and pair them with the project. Um, but you also, there are agents who represent picture books. So I would definitely start with that process of going to an agent um, if you're looking to be traditionally published. And then the other thing I'd say is there's a really wonderful organization called the Society for Children's Books, Writers and Illustrators. So if you're writing kids books, whatever, um, whatever age, reading level, check them out. And especially here in Texas, there are some really great chapters. Do you do anything with the SCVWI, Carolyn? I don't actually. Um, I, I did a little, I was uh, hanging out with them a little bit in Los Angeles, but at that time, that group was a little younger than stuff I was doing. It was more kind of picture book, younger right. stuff. Um, and yeah, and I also I was gonna say the writing bar and all of Bethany's classes are incredible. So then if there are such things as developmental writers, uh, what are the ways regular meetings would be run? So uh, writers groups, and, and this is, you know, the question of what, a little bit like what Michelle was just talking about, having a writers group where you actually exchange pages and share um, feedback and, you know, do that kind of workshopping that is done in MFA programs and other places. And yeah, I think that this is one of those questions that we get a lot and I still haven't really figured out the best way to go about um, helping people find these groups, but we're at the Writers League working on this ourselves and are gonna be making some announcements in that regard soon. Right. But I don't know if you guys have any tips on how you would, I mean, I do well, think going to classes and getting to know other writers through that experience can be a good way. And some people have been making some good points in the chat room, which is about making sure that you're giving your genre to the right people, mm -hmm. right? That if you write sci-fi and you're giving it to people who don't like sci-fi, you're never gonna get very good feedback. And I do think that's really important in a writer's group, right? That whatever group you form, you know, if, if there are people that, you know, really don't like YA and aren't interested in it, or they aren't interested in romance, then that's not the group for you, and you should be fine leaving it. Um, there's, uh, there is an, also a romance uh, writers group in town um, that I think is, is very good. Um, but also on meetup.com, there are tons of writers groups on meetup.com, and some of yep. them are just, there's sit up, wait, sit down, shut up, and write, mm -hmm. which is just about everyone's showing up and writing and they don't act, that's just not a talking group that's just writing but there are definitely ones where people get up get in and workshop um and i listen i also think it's okay to start with a really big group and figure out who your people are right yeah. like, okay they write the same thing i do i like her opinion he's smart you know let's 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 splinter off you know if you if you need to yeah, breaking up is hard to do, guys, but break up with your writing group if it doesn't feel like the right fit. Especially if you have a mean person. If you have someone who's always negative, got to get out of there. I think we covered, um, I'm going to skip this because it's more of a statement. <laughs> um, we are at the end of our questions. Uh, I do want to say one thing really quick before I want to say uh, anyone who has lingering questions, if you want to throw them in the chat box, um, right now would be the time and we'll turn to them. Thank you for being so patient and sticking with us. But I do want to mention an event that we have coming up on Saturday um, this week. It's the One Page Salon, which if you guys have not been to a One Page Salon, it's a pretty special event that is usually in person, but is actually now being hosted virtually by the Writers League with Owen Edgerton. Um, and what we're doing is making it a fundraiser every month. So in May, we raised money for Bookwoman, an independent feminist bookstore here in Austin. We raised close to $1,000 for Bookwoman, which was wonderful. And we are Saturday night raising money for the Deep Bellum Emergency Fund for 
Texas Literary Artists, which is basically a fund um, that all of the money that that is raised will go directly to artists who've been impacted by COVID-19 and who are hurting right now and could use um, some help. So it's a great night. It's got uh, readings from a lot of really wonderful writers and it's just a super fun um, you know, break from everything else. So if you're interested, I hope you guys will check it out on our website and come to that. But I don't see any other questions that have popped up. And I guess that I would say, um, a big thank you to both of you and, you know, give you maybe a, a, an opportunity to give a parting word after, you know, this discussion about anything that, you know, you would want to say to folks before we stop for the evening regarding the topic, the traditional publishing versus do it yourself. What are your final words? Carolyn, I'm looking right at your face, so I'm going to start oh. with you. <laughs> I think the important thing, honestly, is that there is no wrong answer, right? That um, whatever you do, <laughs> I'm gonna sound like a parent, whatever you do is a learning experience, but it really is. And that, um, as I said, I mean, as you guys know now that I've, I, I've done a little bit of each and they've all been incredibly useful and incredibly educational. Um, and I've learned a lot about myself in the process and I have a varied background. I've done a lot of production and directing and I'm a bit of a control freak and for me to be able to see my sales every single day is fantastic <laughs> and when I was traditionally published I got my you know royalty statement every six months and you know and it's like five months after it all happened you know and I would probably be like what's this so it suits my personality and it doesn't suit everybody's. And you might be really frustrated and think this really stunk and I, I didn't sell any books or I sold one book to my brother. That doesn't mean that you can't turn around and then decide to do it traditionally and send it out to agents. You know, like you're not, you're not closing off, you're not shutting all doors by choosing one way, you know? So that's, I guess what I would say is, you know, that, um, that each thing is, is a way to learn. I love it, thank you. Michelle Howry, what are your parting words? No, no pressure, but you're representing all of traditional publishing right now. <laughs> no, I would agree that there is there are many paths, and there's not um, once you step a foot on one path does not mean that you're on that path forever. Um, there's you're, you can hop off, hop back on, um, but just to sort of circle back to the very first thing that we said is that you know even in these weird, uncertain times, I just want to assure everyone that like publishers are really looking for new books and new voices and um, and debut authors and you know authors who are remaking themselves I mean I feel like there's a um, there's a really we, we want to buy books and we want to keep publishing books and we want to keep finding great books so the hunger is out there and please keep writing and please keep sending us great stuff oh my gosh thank you so much to both of you for being here and for sharing your your awesomeness with all of us. Um, Thanks for staying awake, Carolyn. <laughs> Thanks for staying awake, Carolyn. Thanks for staying awake an hour longer, Michelle, because you're an hour ahead. Um, thank you to everybody who joined us. We had a really nice crowd. I saw you guys chatting it up on the chat box, which was super fun. And I hope you'll come on Saturday to the One Page Salon. If you aren't sure what it is, if you have any questions, you guys can email me directly. I'll put my email in the thingy. Um, but we will uh, put this video up also on our YouTube so you'll get a chance to circle back to it if you want to be able to relive any of these moments um, but come out to the one page salon come out to our other programming and take care of yourselves we're here for you and we wish you a good evening so thanks ladies hey, Rebecca thanks, thanks for guys hosting. of course take care I'm going to turn hey. off my camera I'll stick around and check out the chat box but um you guys are welcome to to sign off Great. bye, bye. Thank, you. thank you